The right systems and operations are crucial to building your business for growth and enable some surprising things. It's the e-commerce master plan podcast here to help you solve your marketing problems and grow your e-commerce business. Cutting through the hype to bring you inspiration and advice from the e-commerce sector and beyond. Here's your host, Chloe Thomas. Hello and welcome. It's great to have you here. In today's episode, we're talking about how the operations team is such a crucial part of building a business from growth. From successful range expansion to going headless, managing costs, personalization, and much, much more. We're going to be talking about ways in which getting your systems and your ops right is going to help every business from the smallest to the largest grow and build a platform for ever faster growth. And we're fair amount in here about listening to your customers as well. Before we get into all that and meet our guest, please do check out our sponsors. This podcast is brought to you by Klaviyo, the email and SMS marketing platform that helps you send messages like an e-commerce expert, even if you're just getting started. Create your free account at klaviyo.com slash masterplan. That's K-L-A-V-I-Y-O dot com slash masterplan. This episode is sponsored by BrightPearl, the retail operating system that helps multi-channel commerce brands grow fearlessly. Did you know, according to research by BrightPearl, four in 10 consumers will use non-traditional shopping platforms to do their holiday shopping this year. Platforms like Alexa, WhatsApp or Pinterest. Are you all set to cash in on this latest shift in shopping habits? No? Then join BrightPearl's free webinar hosted by me that will ensure you don't miss out. Get your free ticket at brightpearl.com forward slash master plan now. And now to introduce today's special guest. Dan Nephew is the Director of Systems and Operations at Love Pop, a bricks and clicks seller of magical pop-up greetings cards. Founded in 2014, they gained Shark Tank investment in 2015 and last year grew by 44%. Hello, Dan. Hey, Chloe. Nice to meet you. Glad to be here. It's great to have you here. I've just given our listeners a quick overview of Love Pop, but how did you get started in e-commerce? I got started with Love Pop about two and a half years ago. I was consulting for a small company. One at Love Pop was one of my clients. Fell in love with the company. Fell in love with the leadership and the mission, and you know, didn't look back when they when they made me an offer. Um, so I've been with yeah, I've been with them now just a little over two and a half years. So I like to say uh, I've been with them three Mother's Day seasons, which is our big season. So, <laughs> so that's really important. <laughs> yeah, I, I used to work for a gift retailer a very long time ago. And I always think I did two Christmases because that was the, you know, it's not about how many months or how many years you're there. It's how many big seasons you did. Yes. So, yeah, I, I get that t- three Mother's Day completely, which is, is um, strikes me as a slightly surprising holiday time to do it. But I guess, is that because, you know, so much of the pop-up cards and the other products, is it because they're flower based? Is it, is it just evolved to become a really big Mother's Day piece? So yes, to answer the question directly, but our seasons kind of run, we run, we're very seasonal holiday Christmas, right. Is always a big season for us, but Valentine's day, even bigger, shorter, but bigger. And then the granddaddy, our Christmas, as I like to say is Mother's Day. Uh, because, you know, you have to give your mother's mother something, right? So <laughs> if you, the last resort, you get them a card, even better, you get them a card with a flower, right? Even better, you give them a flower bouquet, which we make. And as I like to say for Mother's Day, unlike like Valentine's Day or even Father's Day, to be honest with you, but Mother's Day, you know, if you're married, you have two mothers, so they both have to have, you know, something and you have to get them something. Fathers, it's hit or miss. Uh, you don't really necessarily have to give them anything, right? Not everybody has a Valentine, so it doesn't work out. But uh, Mother's Day is just huge. I was when you said about that, you know, if you're married, you have two mothers. I was just thinking, and so often it's one of the people in a marriage who looks after the gifting. So it's it's possibly one of the only times a year where you can tr- you can manage to sell two to one person. Where is it? You know, Valentine's Day, hopefully there's not that many people buying two Valentines to give to different people. Exactly. But, but Mother's Day, there's that real kind of doubling up potential. 
Yes. It's always a good time of year. It's spring, you know, so it's, it's always just a great time of year. Also, it kind of bleeds together the, the, you know, the flowers as well as the, you know, gifting. Very nice. Well, look, um, uh, now we've got past Mother's Day, let's find out a little bit more about Love Pop. So where in the world is Love Pop based and where are you selling? We sell all over the world. Um, we're based, a uh, Boston-based company. We have a wholly owned factory in Vietnam. So uh, all of our manufacturing uh, is done in Vietnam and assembly. All the cards are hand assembled and then we bring them into the U.S., ship them out, provide that value added services, ship them out all over the world. We ship to, I don't know how many countries I should know that, but, uh, it's more than a dozen different countries Mm -hmm. that we ship to, but mostly U S based, uh, to be honest with you, mostly that's the, the 90% of our business is U S based. Yeah. I had a look at your, uh, your kind of stockists and stores map, in preparation for this. And, and yeah, it's, it's clearly very heavily US, but you, you do quite a bit of wholesale as well, don't you? Both around the world and um, within the US. So selling to other retailers. We do. We have a great partnership with several uh, small mom and pop stores, as well as, you know, some bigger box retailers that we, that we partner with. And those, those relationships are great because we can't, you know, even though e-commerce is the bulk of our business, we can't be everywhere. And some, you know, people like to actually feel, touch the product. That's a, it's a part of the experience. So the more, you know, retail locations we can be in it is even better for us. It promotes the brand. It, it helps people understand the product a little better. I can definitely see it's one of those products you might see in a physical retail store and then you become hooked and you translate it over to the website. So I love the fact you're selling in so many places. And the, what's the on the e-commerce side of things, what's the platform you're using? Are you a Shopify, a Magento or something bespoke? Uh, we use Shopify. Um, we also sell on Amazon, but uh, Shopify is our e-commerce platform. We've gone headless recently mm-hmm. to help expand the experience and give us a lot more flexibility you know, we're big enough now that we can manage that uh, internally with our with our development team. It's going to just, you know, open up some different avenues for customer experience that we, you know, were more challenging before. So I always find it quite interesting about at what point a business should go headless, because I rarely think it's on day one. No. You know, when you're first testing things out, but then there comes that tipping point where you need that additional functionality. So do you think it's something you've done at the right time or late or early, or is it too early to tell? Like anything else, when we kind of do a retro on it, we probably wish we'd have done it sooner. (laughs) It's just life, isn't it? (laughs) It's just life. Yes. Uh, But timing for us was really good in the sense that it, it was off season, you know, so we did it over the summer and, you know, that's kind of our down season so we can spend more time on it. I would say to answer your other question, like, should you do it right away? Absolutely not. Like Shopify is a wonderful platform, provides a ton of functionality. And the last thing you want to do when you're starting your business is spend all your time on IT related, you know, support application systems. That's not spend your time on your product. And Shopify allows you to kind of do that, which is wonderful. As you grow, like we did, now you're adding more value added services. You know, we have a whole like schedule a card and personal experience. You can actually write your own custom note, upload your own picture. We will hand insert it into the card, send it out. It looks like it just came from you and your house. And we do all that. You know, that requires a more robust application on the front end to build that experience. Um, And Shopify support us forever on that, but we've just gotten to a point where now we want to do even more with it, more advanced, you know, customer experience type functionality on the front end. And uh, it's opening up those doors for us. So, As with so many things in business, life and e-commerce, wait until you've got a problem you need to solve rather than trying, you know, because there's plenty of them out there rather than trying to solve problems you don't have yet. Now, Dan, we don't often get on the podcast people who specialize in the ops side of Hmm. e-commerce. However, over over the last couple of months, we seem to have been covering an awful lot of back-end stuff on the show, which I think is entirely right because of the huge shift in online spending we've had over, over recent months and over the last 18 months. It seems that 
and the, the developments that are happening in the space, it seems like it's exactly the right time to be shining a bit more of a light on the back end of things. But as somebody who works in that day to day within an e-commerce business, have you found that you're getting kind of called into discussions more often than normal? Is there more light being shone on you as well as the topic? <laughs> yes, actually, uh, I mean, I was brought in to help kind of support that our back end systems when I started, you know, we were grossly outgrew. They served a purpose that kind of got us up and running, kept track of the inventory, kind of, <laughs> um, you know, helped us manage costs, kind of. But, you know, as we got more complex, we needed better, just far better systems to help manage that. And when I came in, we ended up implementing a system called Bright Pearl, uh, which has been hugely valuable to kind of support that that back end order management, inventory management, supply chain enablement functionality for us. And yes, I think it is critically important. Obviously, that's what I do. Um, but as I like to say, you know, we, I I didn't coin the same, but another partner of mine did. Uh, we deliver on the promise, right? We deliver the magical moments for our business. So you, it's kind of both have to work together. You got to have great products, great ideas, great marketing. But you also had to be able to deliver on that. And more and more, the, the experience is based on the delivery. And that's what people remember. So if that piece is poor or not great, and in our case, you know, if we can't deliver within a couple of days, if, you know, cards come damaged, right? If, you know, we can't uh, provide the services that we want, like customization, it's all, it just all doesn't help. Uh, so those systems have to, on the back end, be very robust to be able to support that. Because in any e-commerce business, it's it's a moment of truth when the customer gets the product and you want them to be happy and excited and to love it because that's going to lead them to spend more money with you and come back and all those great things and, to, and tell their friends about you as well. But that's, you know, for most e-commerce businesses, they are delivering to the person who placed the order and when it arrives, isn't that important? However, when you are delivering someone's Mother's Day gift, mm -hmm. it's got to arrive at the right time. You're not delivering it to the person who ordered it. So you've kind of got all the trust of the person who ordered to say, you better get this right. Otherwise, my mother or my mother-in-law is not going to be impressed with me. Right. So it, it's, it really raises the bar a bit, doesn't it? It's like it becomes ever more crucial. There's a lot more for you to lose as a business if you don't get it spot on. Yes. Yep. Absolutely. We, I mean, we have people ordering Valentine's day cards now. Wow. Probably because they screwed up last year and forgot. Uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> so, uh, but yes, you can schedule out and that, you know, that's one of those things. And then, you know, people check that off their list, they're done with it. And then they remember, Oh yeah, that's right. I got that. I got that taken care of. And then if you don't follow through on it, you're in trouble. Right. So mm. that's, that's all part of it. And then when uh, when all the the elements of personalization is added into the mix, it just gets a whole load more complicated. But yes. one of the things I wanted to ask you about is I think there's there's often this this perception that the ops piece starts from after checkout has happened. You know, it's kind of like, well, we do all the clever marketing, we do the clever segmentation, we design some awesome products, we get the website working really well, and then people place orders and we just go, Dan, here's some orders, do your Fill thing, it. you know? And actually, it strikes me that true ops really gets involved in every part of the business. It's not just a, here's some orders, deal with them, go worry about the warehouse and the couriers and leave us with everything else. So do you find you get involved in every stage of the business? We do. Um, it actually, from my perspective, it starts with product development. Mm -hmm. So we, we play a big role in product setup, the tail end of product design. So a big success factor, at least for us in the last you know couple of years, has been the expansion of product categories. For example, you know, when we started, we had one product, it was very easy, right? We sold, you know, pop-up greeting cards and we didn't have the complexity that we have today with bouquets and toys and ornaments and, you know, you name it, uh, centerpieces that you can buy, you know, with Thanksgiving, Halloween coming up, you can get a giant pumpkin put out, you know? So, you know, there's, there's a lot of different complexities and those products, unfortunately, for ops, are not all the same size, shape, 
cost, price, shipment requirements. <laughs> they are all very different. <laughs> and so we get involved way up front, make sure that how are you going to ship this product, right? Um, how are we going to store this product? What's the experience going to be like for the, for the customer and to make sure that the supply chain components and the system supporting all that can systemically fulfill on what marketing and design and our product development teams envision it to be. And they're not just assuming, oh, we can create whatever we want and ops will figure it out. Uh, we try to figure it out ahead of time so that we're all coordinated throughout the whole life cycle of a product. I guess it is well, not quite a negotiation because you're all on the same team and you're all striving for the same ends, which is a cost-effective product, which the customers love and buy loads of. But there is that kind of negotiation between the vision of the product developers and the marketing team and what is feasibly possible. So I think sometimes it can be the case that 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 negotiation can break down in a business and the ops guy becomes the guy who says no, mm. um, you know, and the, and the branding people become those annoying people with, with those stupid ideas from the ops perspective. <laughs> um, clearly as a successful business who are expanding and who all, all the, all the products are not the same size, you've got a good relationship going with that. Have you got any kind of tips for anyone who has those kind of headbutting moments to, to really pull together and, and deliver good, Good, good goods, I suppose. Uh, don't say no. Uh, <laughs> find a way. So say, here's how we can do it. Uh, and to be quite honest, that's what we do a lot of times. So as, as much as sometimes you're like, wow, this is going to be really challenging. Our motto is you just don't say no. We find a way to make it happen. Now, it may be slightly different experience, right? Maybe slightly different cost. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe slightly different timeline because we got to put in systems, you know, so for, for example, our marketing team presented us, you know, a few years ago with different channel opportunities, uh, with some big box retailers, well, we don't have EDI. So it wasn't like we could just say, oh, you know, we're going to send, you know, somebody, a bunch of cards are going to sell them in their stores. Like, no, 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 we need systems for that. So you don't say no, you say, here's what it's going to take. I have to put these in. It's going to take this time, right? And, and you make it happen. It's the same with mm -hmm. they send you a different product type and then now it has different packaging and fulfillment requirements or customer experience requirements on the back end. We we tend to say we'll find a way, if you will. That's kind of my motto. If you're being bought in at the beginning of the conversation, it's a lot easier to to find a way than it is if here's the finished product, Dan. Yeah. Make it work. <laughs> so it's, yeah, two very different conversations. But you mentioned EDI. What is EDI? Oh, so that that's just a electronic data interchange, basically exchange of sales, inventory, invoicing. It's a way. It's an archaic <laughs> form of integrating systems uh, other, other than an API integration, which was a much more modern form. But many of your old legacy retailers, you like, you know, the biggest ones out there provide, uh, that's all they provide in terms of ways to connect. And if you don't connect that way, they don't do business with you. So. Yeah. And you're, you're never going to get them to change. So you've got to be ready no. to deal with their systems. It is, it is, I, I, we are not going to pursue this tangent, but it is amazing how many crazy old systems retailers still use in their businesses yes. that are unsupported and all the rest of it, but they cling on to it anyway. Like I said, we're not going to follow that tangent. We're just going to marvel at it. <laughs> um, so Dan, with you've got a lot of complex stuff going on in the ops side of what all on the front of it looks like quite a simple, straightforward business. It's a pop-up gift card, but actually you've got a, quite a wide product range of different challenging pieces. You've got the gift element, the personalized element. You've got Amazon to keep happy, those big box retailers to keep happy, and a wholesale supply chain around the world. Is, is We mentioned Bright Pearl already, so I'm guessing having the right tech platform to manage the orders and where they all go and keep track of the inventory and help you see where the costs are is crucial to making that whole complex piece possible. Yeah, it's without it, you, you're going to die a slow death. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, like, I mean, Bright Pearl has been a huge factor in our kind of ability to sustain growth and scale effectively. 
Um, what I like to say is, you know, like, like I say, don't say no in the operation side. Bright Pro allows us to not say no. It gets rid of the friction. So if we have to add another ch sales channel, like very simple to do. If we have to add another product category, very simple to do. If marketing wants us to add 17 different product attributes on our taxonomy so that when the sales are reported, we can reflect all those different slices and dices to understand from our planning system what to order next and what customers are buying. Bright Pearl makes enables that to do. It creates workflow. We'd have millions of orders come through our system, millions. Because as you can imagine, it's not like cars. We have you know high revenue, not a lot of sales. Mm -hmm. We're the opposite. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we have a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of little sales. And seasonally, we also have that. You know, I mean, we, yes, we do have people that schedule cards for earlier than probably they need to, but they do. But the fulfillment, you know, for Valentine's Mother's Day all happens within a matter of a few weeks. So we have a highly seasonal business. We need a system that can not only take orders effectively, but pump them out at the time that they need to. So being able to have high volume transactions flow through our system is, is very important. Workflow, uh, another piece, hugely valuable. Like I said, we have millions of orders. We can't touch them all. I can't physically go in and say, okay, allocate the inventory for this order. Now fulfill it. Now add the <laughs> tracking number, right? Like, I mean, there's this, like, that's never going to happen. So it has been a big part of our ability to scale. We don't have to think about it. And that's what people like. Now, Dan, you mentioned that you are a, you're not like the car sellers, you are a low AOV, low average order value business, which makes, you know, minimizing the cost of ops so much more important, I think. Oh, I think it's important in every business, but it really brings it to the fore. So would you say that across everything you're doing with within the ops team, is it is your focus more on saving cost or increasing sales? Sales by far sales by far. So enabling sales to flow is still our primary goal because we're still growing. As you mentioned at the top, we, I mean, we grew 44% last year. We we're up something like, I should check with the marketing folks, but they tell me we're like, we've gone 500 fold since our inception, like, and we're not stopping. Our only constraint is capacity to grow. So like, that's the problem we face every year, every quarter when we're planning, which is, okay, where do we make our bets? We have limited capacity to invest. We're going to try to invest in the most growth that we can. So it's less, cost is always important. I mean, we can't, you know, we don't have, our money doesn't grow on trees, but as they say, but uh, it is focused on sales and enabling those sales channels and enabling that flow, anything to do with customer experience or sales. E-commerce Master Plan is supported by some of the greatest companies in the e-commerce sector. Here's a reminder of who they are. Ready to turn your small e-commerce business into the next big thing? Klaviyo can help. It's the easy to use email and SMS platform that gives you everything you need to build genuine relationships with your customers. And even if you're new to marketing, Klaviyo can help you become an email expert with drag and drop design templates, simple insights and made for e-commerce reports and recommendations. Give it a try today with a free account at klaviyo.com slash masterplan. That's K-L-A-V-I-Y-O dot com slash master plan. This episode is sponsored by Bright Pearl, the retail operating system that helps multi-channel commerce brands grow fearlessly. Research shows that consumers plan to do their holiday shopping on TikTok, Pinterest and Alexa. To help you capitalise on this opportunity, Bright Pearl are hosting a free webinar packed with brand new insight and real world advice from high growth commerce brands on what you can do now to make sure you maximise your potential this peak season. Reserve your free spot today at brightpearl.com forward slash master plan. It's time for the top tips round. Okay, Dan, I love this section because it gives me and our listeners some really quick ideas for taking our business to the next level. So are you ready for the top tips? Sure. Bring them on. <laughs> Here we go then. The book top tip. If everyone listening to this podcast agreed to take Friday off and read a book to make their business better, which book would you recommend? Oh, boy. Full transparency, I'm not a book reader. So if you have Friday off, 
I would recommend you connect, <laughs> uh, especially given the last year plus with this pandemic. Connection is, is actually a core value at Love Pop. It's one of those things that makes us who we are. I would actually say, don't tell my daughter this because I she reads all the time and I think it's wonderful. But put down the book uh, and go connect with somebody uh, and have an experience would be my recommendation right now. I love that. I'm a big lover of books too, but I think certainly a lot of the time connection is what we need. And at the moment, even those of us who want to go and hide in the books, it's probably a good idea too. It's a very, <laughs> very timely advice there, Dan. Thank you. Uh, okay. The traffic top tip, which marketing method do you either prize above all others or think doesn't get the press it deserves? We do a lot of Facebook advertising. Um, we do a lot of email marketing uh, as well. I think both are extremely valuable. So like our brand marketing, we do a lot of Facebook advertising and it's it's very valuable. It's easy to connect uh, with a lot of people. You get immediate feedback, which I think is something that is re- you don't have to spend hours and months and days creating marketing campaigns to only find out that it didn't work. Like mm-hmm. you get immediate feedback. So that is a huge channel that's for us that, that is con- we're going to continue to leverage. And then on the other side, the email marketing, that's, that's you know, I guess it, from a cost standpoint, I know we don't normally talk about cost, but it's really inexpensive. <laughs> it doesn't <laughs> yeah. take much to send an email uh, to people that want them, obviously, right? So you, that's, that's always the rub. People don't like too many emails, but people do enjoy them too. So it's, I would say those two channels don't get enough kind of, they're inexpensive, they get you get great feedback right away, and from a marketing standpoint, that's what you want. Most certainly is. Okay, the tool top tip: maybe a collaboration tool, a social media plugin, a phone app, or just a way of working. Is there a cool little tool you use that makes you and your team more efficient from day to day? We have a lot. Um, so I'm on the system side too, and I I can't tell you how many systems we have. One that I use all the time. And we actually now have partners that we we request also use it is Slack. I can't tell you how many channels I have, how many Slack messages I get a day. The collaboration that it, that allows you, especially in supply chain. So like we can communicate directly with our 3PL on order issues or changes we want to make or projects we're working on. And it's just so efficient and just the plugins it has. If, you know, something's turning into something you don't want to type, you can quickly jump on a Zoom call, keep collaborating, share documents and files. It's hugely valuable tool for us in our business. Excellent. And I think probably now the most popular tool to be mentioned on this podcast. Is it really? Um, yeah. yeah. It doesn't surprise yeah. me. I mean, they. it's great. And no knock against Microsoft and Teams. It, it's just not the same. Okay, the growth top tip then. If you met someone today who's focused on growing their e-commerce business from 100 orders per month to 1,000, what would be your number one tip for them? Connect. So getting back to the connection. So know your customer. And it's interesting. So the bulk of our business is e-commerce by and by and large, but we started retail. Like we started with a little, you know, I wasn't around, but, you know, they started with a little kiosk selling the product and showing people the product, engaging people. And our retail presence is still really valuable to get that customer interaction and understanding of how they interact with the product, what they like, what they don't like. I would say if you're that early in your journey, connect with every single person that buys your product and ask them why they bought it. That would be my advice. Perfect advice. I love that advice because it works for businesses of all sizes. Whether you're trying to get from 100 to 1,000 or from 1,000 to 10,000, the answer almost always lies with the customers if you just take the time to listen to them. Dan, that's been awesome. Before we say goodbye, could you please let the listeners know where they can find you and the business on web and social media, please? Sure. Um, So Google us at lovepop.com. Very simple. You can find us on all our wonderful products. And then I'm on LinkedIn if you want to look me up, Dan Nephew. So uh, more than happy to chat with you. Anybody who loves to collaborate on anything related to customer experience or systems, you know, please feel free to reach out. 
Excellent. You had to say that bit about connecting at the end there, Dan, after those <laughs> answers you've been giving us. Um, <laughs> well, look, Dan, thank you so much for being on the e-commerce master plan podcast today. It's been lovely talking about the big picture that is getting your ops right. Um, and thanks for sharing so much as well. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Appreciate it. Really great there to speak to someone who is all about the ops. And, you know, it really isn't just about that back end piece of how you get the product to the customer. It goes right from the very beginning of product creation and getting to understand the customers. And surprisingly, I think also a lot of us think that ops is all about cost reduction. Clearly, from what Dan's saying, it's more about making sure there's the space to enable the growth for the business through the suppliers they're using, through how they're working with people, through how they're building the systems and the processes in the business. Very much an enabling team, I think, within Love Pop. You can get your hands on the notes from today's show, including those top tips and links to everything we mentioned by heading over to ecommercemasterplan.com forward slash podcast. There you can also add yourself to our email list so you don't miss out on any of the many other things we share to help you improve your business. If you liked this episode, then make sure you check out recent episode 347, where I'm joined by Jeremy Bodenhammer, author of Adapt or Die, which is a book all about how technology can help you hugely improve the warehouse processes and all those things really we've been talking about today. So it's really going to help you build on what we've been talking today, if that's inspired you. Thank you for tuning into this and every episode that you do of the e-commerce master plan podcast. I bring you a new interview every week because I want to inspire and help e-commerce business owners to succeed and thrive with their businesses. So if you know someone this show can help, please, please, please tell them to listen to the e-commerce master plan podcast. I hope you have a brilliant week and keep optimizing. Thank you for listening to the e-commerce master plan podcast. Find out more at ecommercemasterplan.com slash podcast.